I'm speaking to you from the campus of Helderberg College of Higher Education. I want to express on behalf of our college family, our heartfelt condolences to all the families who have lost loved ones, particularly due to the injustices that we have watched and witnessed in the media this past week. Racism has no place and no space in any part of this world. The Sabbath reminds us that we have all been made in the image of God and our value can be seen in the shed and red blood of Jesus Christ. I sang the song as a child and I still believe it even now as an adult. Red and yellow, black and white, all are precious in his sight. We need to not only treat each other with love and respect, but we must stand united against the evils that are rampant and prevalent in our society. May God give us the wisdom, discernment and courage to stand up and to speak up for those who are weak and for those who have no voice and for those who have been marginalised. By God's grace and with his help, we shall overcome. In case you've missed it. So much has happened this week. Here in South Africa, we've transitioned from level four to level three. It has been an easing of lockdown restrictions, meaning that some have already returned to school or work. Masks on faces, sanitizers in pockets, uncertainty in minds and apprehension in hearts. Level three has meant social distancing, temperature checking and COVID-19 committees complying. But everything coronavirus related has seemingly taken a back seat this week. The tragic and unjust deaths of black Americans at the hands of the very people who promised to serve and protect them has dominated our news feeds. It's been on all our social media platforms. Peaceful protests have been disrupted by rioting and looting. And this has brought scenes of destruction, desperation and despair. But amidst the tear gas, shattered glass, disgruntled voices and lost lives, there is a word from the Lord. A word which is powerful, a word which is relevant and a word which is right at this time. This week, we've read, seen and heard about the four police officers who were present, who were responsible and are accountable for the death of George Floyd. But today. This Sabbath day, I want to talk to you about four men who were not afraid to do what was right. We don't know them by name, but we know them by their actions. Their story is found in Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through to 12. The King James Version renders and records it this way. And again, he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noised that he was in the house. And straightway, Many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son... Thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately, when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed? And walk, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. The New International Version records it this way. We have never seen anything like this. I want to speak to you today under the subject heading, Jesus is in the house. 
the gospel writer Mark records that the people from the city of Capernaum were saying to each other, Jesus is in the house. Jesus is in the house. Jesus is in the house. You must understand that this phrase, Jesus is in the house, tells us more than just Jesus's geographical location. For Jesus was in the house of Peter, which was in Capernaum. But more than just telling us that Jesus was at Peter's house, this statement, Jesus is in the house, is a Jewish idiomatic expression, which can be translated to mean Jesus is at home. If you want further evidence that Jesus was at home in Capernaum, you can turn to your Bibles and go to Matthew chapter 9 verse 1. Now the first eight verses of Matthew chapter 9 parallel with our passage of study in Mark chapter 2, the first 12 verses. In other words, it is the same story. Matthew chapter 9 verse 1 records, and he, meaning Jesus, entered into a ship and passed over and came into his own city. Capernaum is referred to as Jesus's own city, even though Bethlehem was where Jesus was born, even though Nazareth was where Jesus was raised, Capernaum was where Jesus was welcomed. And so Capernaum is referred to as Jesus's own city. And there's a preaching point right there that if you would welcome Jesus into your life, if you would invite him into your plans, if you would allow him access to the decisions that you make, if you would make him your personal Lord and your Saviour, Jesus will call you his own. Mark chapter 2 was not the first time that Jesus was in Capernaum. In Mark 1, Jesus had entered Capernaum synagogue on the Sabbath day, interpreting and instructing in God's word. The people marveled and were amazed at his authority. They even said that it superseded the authority of the scribes. During that Sabbath service, a demonically possessed man disturbed, distracted, disrupted and diverted the attention of the congregation. Seeing that this man wanted to be free from Satan, Jesus drove out this unclean spirit. Again, the people marveled and were amazed at his authority. After the Sabbath service, Jesus went to Peter's house and found Peter's mother-in-law sick with a fever. Jesus took her by the hand, lifted her up, and her fever was gone. This powerful Jesus on that Sabbath day had exhibited his authoritative power in explaining and expounding God's word. This powerful Jesus on that Sabbath day had executed his authoritative power in exercising a demon. This powerful Jesus on that Sabbath day had demonstrated his authoritative power in healing someone who was suffering with a sickness. News travelled far and wide about this mighty man, this marvellous, miraculous, mountain-moving, problem-solving, soul-saving, situation-changing, body-healing, life-transforming wonder-worker. Jesus was not only a preacher and a teacher, he was a healer. The people of Capernaum heard that Jesus was at Peter's house and they wanted to bring their sick to him to be healed by him. But it was still Sabbath. And so they feared that the rabbis would condemn them for breaking the Sabbath. And so they waited and waited and waited. And when the sun had set and the Sabbath was now over, they all came to Peter's house. The deaf, the dumb, the diseased and the disabled all were brought to Jesus and all were healed by him. Not one of these were turned away. Jesus was their GP, not a general practitioner, but the great physician. You did not need to make an appointment. You could just come as you are. This was a medical aid and a private health care that everybody could afford because the fee was free. The only condition was that you come by faith. And so they came in with their sicknesses, but they went out healthy and happy. Jesus did not stop until everybody who had come to him was relieved from their suffering. You would have thought that Jesus would have been satisfied in healing so many from their illnesses and relieving so many from their pain. However, 
in the book The Desire of Ages, page 260, paragraph 2, it records this. Jesus was not satisfied to attract attention to himself merely as a wonder worker or a healer of physical diseases. He was seeking to draw men to him as their saviour. The people thought they were seeking Jesus, but Jesus was seeking them. Luke chapter 19 verse 10 says that Jesus says the son of man came to seek and to save that which was lost. And so in order for the people not to get a perverted perception of his mission, Jesus left Capernaum to minister to the surrounding cities. There he met a leper and cured this leper of his leprosy. Now this man was told by Jesus not to tell anybody about his healing, but he tells everybody about his healing. And so the multitudes make their way to Jesus. They did not come to hear him, but to be healed by him. But Jesus knew accepting the message was more important than receiving the miracle. And so Mark chapter 2 verse 1 writes, And again, he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noised that he was in the house. Last time, Jesus taught in the synagogue. This time, he teaches in Peter's house. Last time, the people declared that Jesus' authority superseded that of the scribes. This time, the scribes and the Pharisees from Galilee, Judea and Jerusalem come to watch and to witness this man with supposed superior authority. They were spies looking to condemn Jesus. And so the house is full. There's no place to sit. There's no place to stand. Even outside the house, a crowd had gathered. Interestingly, in the book of Mark, crowds act as obstacles to Jesus. In Mark chapter 3, the mother and brothers of Jesus cannot get to him because of the crowd. In Mark chapter 5, Jairus, a ruler in the synagogue, requests Jesus to save his dying daughter. But it appears that Jesus is not moving fast enough because he's being slowed down by the crowd. In this same chapter, the woman with the issue of blood needs to creep and to crawl in order to get to Jesus because of the crowd. In Mark chapter 10, when blind beggar Bartimaeus cries out to Jesus, he is told to keep quiet by people in the crowd. Crowds acted as obstacles to Jesus, but I'm here today to inform you and to encourage you that you should not let anyone or anything stop you from coming to Jesus. Not the bad things that you have done in the past, not your present lukewarm condition, not your pride, not a person who refuses to work with you or a group of people who may say things about you, not a particular cherished sin. Don't let anything prevent you from coming to Jesus. The songwriter says it best and it ought to be the mantra of our lives. Nothing between my soul and the saviour. Perhaps this was the thinking and the feeling of the paralyzed man. For there was in Capernaum a paralyzed man who lay lifeless and motionless on his mat. He was limited and restricted to the help of others. Even the simplest of things he could not do for himself. But the real problem was not that he was physically helpless. It was that he was spiritually hopeless. The Desire of Ages, page 267, paragraph 3 reads, This paralytic had lost all hope of recovery. His disease was the result of a life of sin. The scribes and the Pharisees had pronounced him incurable. This paralytic man was in this paralyzed state because of his sin. He was in this situation because of his sin. But do not assume and presume that every time you see somebody who is sick or somebody who is suffering or somebody who is in a bad situation, that it is because of their sin. Joseph was put in a pit, was sold into slavery, was placed in a prison, but it wasn't because of his sin. Job 
had his possessions stolen, had his children struck down, had his body affected with blisters and boils, but it was not because of his sin. Jesus was denied, betrayed, spat upon, ridiculed, taunted, tempted, and tormented, but it was not because of his sin. Don't make the mistake of thinking that every homeless person, every incarcerated person, every person who is suffering is only suffering because it's their fault. But even if it's their fault, they're still in need of our help. The four friends of this paralyzed man told their paralytic friend that there was a man who was not like any other man, a man who had no servants, yet they called him master, a man who had no degrees, but they called him teacher, a man who had no medicine, yet they called him healer. And so the paralytic who had been depressed and distressed now had hope because of the faith of his four friends. And let me just pause right here to underline the fact that your faith should positively influence those around you, whether it is at home or at school or at work or at church. Your faith ought to be a source of encouragement to those in your sphere of influence. But these four friends were not content in just talking about Jesus. They wanted to bring their friend into the very presence of Jesus. And our Christianity needs to be more than just theoretical. It needs to be practical. People don't want to just hear about Jesus. They need to experience Jesus. And so in my sanctified imagination, I can see these four men having a board meeting. I move motions one of the friends, that we take our friend to Jesus. I second that motion, signs the second friend. Question calls the third friend. The fourth friend, who is chairing this meeting, looks at his three friends and inquires, all in favour? Say aye. To which the response is a resounding aye. The eyes have it. It's a unanimous decision. The motion is carried. These four friends are going to bring their paralytic friend to Jesus. And so the four men carried their paralytic friend and made their way to Peter's house. They saw the crowd, but they were not discouraged. For every obstacle is an opportunity to demonstrate your faith. And so they went up the steps at the side of the house. It was not easy carrying this paralytic, but they were not disheartened. For every obstacle is an opportunity to demonstrate your faith. And so they came to the roof and they began to break up the hardened mud. They dug deep and removed the branches and pulled out the straw. It was not easy, but they were not dispirited. For every obstacle is an opportunity to demonstrate your faith. It must have been hard work. But my Bible tells me that faith without works is dead. This was a faith that worked. I'm sure that there were those in the house who believed in Jesus's power. But what good is believing in the Sabbath when you refuse to keep it holy? What good is believing in the second coming of Jesus when you neglect to get ready? What good is believing in the spirit of prophecy when you hearken not unto its counsels? What good is believing that God is sovereign and that you are his steward when you fail to return a faithful tithe? What good is believing in anything if it does not move you into action? We need a faith that works. But instead of standing on the promises, they were just sitting on the premises. These were SDAs, sitting down always. But there is a time, my sisters and my brothers, when we ought to get up, to stand up and to speak up. These four men were now on the roof and together with the paralytic, they could see Jesus. But they also saw the judging eyes of everyone watching them. The Pharisees and scribes must have been shaken their heads in disapproval. And then there was Peter the most outspoken of the 12 disciples, he must have said something. This was his roof being damaged after all. Everyone else must have been irritated and infuriated as they were now covered with dirt and dust. These four men must have felt so self-conscious, but don't let anyone or anything stop you from coming to Jesus. 
And so the four friends lowered their friend. The four, because of their faith, worked together in bringing another before Jesus. How difficult it must have been to adjust and readjust the ropes to lower their friend before Jesus. And there is a wonderful truth in that, that as a community of faith, we need to work together in bringing others to Jesus. Not separating ourselves because of colour or culture, because of personality or preference, but realising and recognising that our coming together and our working together is a great witness to those who are watching. Now let me just talk about Jesus. He had already shown his authority in God's word. He had already shown his authority in casting out an unclean spirit. He had already shown his authority in healing the sick. But now Jesus shows his authority to forgive sin. Mark chapter 2 verse 5 reports, when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Don't miss what the text says. It tells us when Jesus saw their faith, not only the faith of the paralytic, but the faith of his four friends. Can you see the importance and the relevance and the significance of your faith influencing others? Your faith for a disobedient child. Your faith for an unbelieving spouse. Your faith For a roommate or a classmate or a friend or neighbour, for a brother or sister, for a work colleague or stranger, your faith can result in others experiencing Jesus' grace and forgiveness. The scribes and Pharisees are outraged by this. Jesus has just blasphemed. They don't say it, but Jesus sees it. In the KJV, that's the King James Version, they say it in their hearts. But in the BMP, that's the Ben McKenzie paraphrase, they text and tweet it on their smartphones. Hashtag Peter's house. Hashtag Jesus is in the house. Hashtag blasphemer, he thinks he's God. Hashtag Jesus must fall. In their hearts, they are ready to condemn and convict Jesus as a blasphemer. For only God can forgive sins. And you know what? I'm not naturally inclined to always agree with the scribes and the Pharisees. But the truth is the truth. Only God can take away our sins. What the scribes and Pharisees failed to realise, which I do recognise, is that Jesus is God. And so as to show his criticizers and scrutinizers who he was. Jesus not only forgave this man of his sins, but he healed him of his disability. For the Bible says in Psalm 103 verses 1, 2 and 3, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth, All thy diseases are, you missed it. God is the one who forgives all our sins. And it is God who is the one who heals all our diseases. Jesus did not verbally say it, but he physically displayed it. That he was not only a man, but that he was God. You don't believe that I have the power to forgive sins? He humbly says. Then believe this. Son, take up your bed. And walk. You would have thought that this action would have changed their reaction for the healing power confirmed Jesus' forgiving power, which identified him as God. Divinity wrapped in humanity. That's what John chapter 1 verse 14 declares. The word, that's Jesus, with his divinity, became flesh. That's Jesus' humanity and dwelt among us. Can I pull the car over to the side of the road but leave the engine running so that I have time to tell you that that word dwelt, skinor in the Greek language, means to pitch a tent or to tabernacle, or to live with, or to take up residence. In other words, Jesus is in the house. 
And because Jesus is in the house, forgiveness of your sins is offered and his healing power may be your experience. Don't be like these religious leaders who had the authority to serve and protect in their community, but stood around idly while one was suffering physically. They had the audacity to say nothing and to do nothing because to them this man was nothing. They did not value human life, but this man was a child of God. Instead of using their power and position for good, they abuse and misuse their power for evil. The accusation that Jesus was a blasphemer is the charge which will ultimately end in his death. And so he lay there. He couldn't move. Surrounded by many people dying in front of their eyes. He cried out for help, but the ones who wanted to help were helpless. They were shocked at what they were witnessing. He was in excruciating pain. No one should suffer like this. The ones who could do something did nothing. He was hurting. They did nothing. He was bleeding. They did nothing. He was finding it harder and harder to breathe. Still, they did nothing. This was an inhumane way to die. They even ridiculed him. If you are the son of God, come down now from the cross. But my Jesus, in agony, dehydrated, blood soaked and blood stained, running out of breath, cries out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Just as Jesus had looked up in Peter's house and saw the faith of the four men, Jesus delays his dying on that cruel cross of Calvary and he looks up in faith. And because of his faithfulness, we have the forgiveness of our sins. And so I think about that Roman centurion in Mark chapter 15, verse 39, who was there when Jesus died. He saw Jesus and said, truly, this man was the son of God. In other words, I've never seen anything like this before. And so I see the life of our saviour flash before my eyes. He was born in a borrowed stable, laid in a borrowed manger, fed 5,000 with a borrowed lunch, sailed in a borrowed boat, slept on a borrowed bed, rolled into Jerusalem on a borrowed donkey, celebrated Passover in a borrowed upper room, was mocked as a king in a borrowed robe, was crucified on a borrowed cross, and at last he was buried in a borrowed tomb. But if you borrow something, it means that you're going to give it back. For early Sunday morning, my Jesus and my Savior got up with all resurrection power. He got out of that borrowed tomb and because Jesus got up and got out, you can get up and get out. You don't have to be down because of your sin. You don't have to stay in your sin, but Jesus' death means we can have eternal life then, but abundant life now. At times, it may feel like the devil is pressing you down. You cannot move, you cannot breathe, but get this, you can call out and cry out to God for help. Don't let the guilt of sin and the shame of sin and the burden of sin suffocate you. You can get up because of the forgiveness we find in Jesus. You can get up because of the strength we have in Jesus. You can get up because of the help we have in Jesus. You can get up because of the hope we have in Jesus. Jesus is in the house. So bring your cares and your concerns to him. Bring your anxiety and your agony to him. Bring your worry and your weakness to him. Come in faith, bringing your fear and your stress and your sin and your doubt and your guilt and your shame to him. Come unto me, he says, all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. So let's take up that invitation and go to God in prayer right now. Gracious God, we thank you for first coming to us in the personhood of Jesus and then inviting us to come to you. We know 
that in you we can have divine rest for our human restlessness. We know that in you we can have a peace that surpasses all understanding to remedy our anxious hearts and our troubled minds. And so we thank you for our Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ. We acknowledge him as our saviour and the only one who can take away our sins. And so we confess our faults and our failures to you. Forgive us, Father God, for the times when we should have spoke up, but we remain silent. Forgive us, Eternal Father, for the times when we should have done something, but we remained inactive. Forgive us, merciful Father, for the times we have mistreated others, forgetting the value you have placed on them and for failing to remember that every life matters. Forgive us, Holy Father, for the times we have misrepresented you, when we were selfish, when we should have been generous, when we were irritable, when we should have been patient, when we were indifferent, when we should have been compassionate. Our faith looks up to thee, thou Lamb of Calvary, Saviour divine. Now hear us while we pray, take all our guilt away. Oh, let us from this day be holy thine. Cleanse us from unrighteousness, create in us a clean heart, renew a right spirit within us, and restore to us the joy of our salvation. We've prayed all these things in the faithful and most precious name of Jesus, our great physician. Amen.